wanted to go into technology banking. Like all things, you know, land of the blind, one-eyed man is king. Were there a lot of African Americans in the technology area at that time? Very few, <laughs> very few. What propelled you to say, I'm gonna give all this up and go start my own company? Very few software companies were actually efficiently run. We took you know, these kernels of best practices. You became very involved in philanthropy. Philanthropic endeavors were part of my family, my family dynamic. One thing we have to do is ensure that our society is a just society. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it, it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist, and nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? When you were growing up in Denver, yeah. Uh, the son of school teachers, mm -hmm. did you ever think you would become the wealthiest African American in the United States? <laughs> I was basically raised in a family of, of oh, I'll call it achievers. You know, my, my mother and my father both had uh, doctorate degrees in education and they emphasized not only to my brother and I but to the rest of the family the importance of, of really, you know, A, becoming educated, B, working really hard and, and you know, C, trying to become the pinnacle of success in, in, in one's community. And, you know, when I look back at those days and the, the formative uh, elements of, of who we were in our communities, I saw parents who, who, who gave generously of time, energy, effort, and intellectual capacity uh, to, our, to our community. And I think what that led me to do was always think about striving for excellence. Talk about your background in a moment, but I'd like to now mm -hmm. just explain to people what you actually did that made this great fortune. What we did and what I was able to do was, was bridge a couple of ideas. You know, software is truly still the most productive tool introduced in our business economy uh, over the last 50 years. And uh, through my work, when I was early as an investment banker, I got to see a number of software companies and how they operated. And I ran across one uh, that turned out to be a client and ultimately the, the owner of that business, that, 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 that trust, ended up being my first investor. And that particular business had a set of practices that, that they used, business practices, that, that helped them run that business more efficiently than any other software company that I, that I had seen. And so, in essence, you know, what, I, what I'll say, you know, took some of the kernels of those best practices and said, if you took them and as an engineer and create a process uh, around delivering those best practices across the world of enterprise software, you could do quite well. When you grew up in Denver, was there a lot of discrimination then against African Americans? I grew up uh, at a time when, when desegregation was just starting. And so prior to that, you know, like all cities in America and large cities, you know, there's, there's segregated communities, and there still are. Uh, for the most part, and it's unfortunate. I grew up in a predominantly African-American community. We all lived in that community for the most part because you still had redlining. You still had an accessibility to, to capital to buy homes, which created, in essence, the basis of a lot of the wealth in America. So it was a time uh, in growing up that I really understood the importance of community, and it was pretty much a segregated community that I grew up in until we started busing, and forced busing created the desegregation, at least in the school systems. When you were very young, your mother brought you to the March in Washington. She did. Uh, when Martin Luther King made his famous speech. I think the impact of her bringing me and my brother here, not only was, you know, for, for the summer, uh, but for us to understand that our community stood for something. Our community was striving for something, and it was important that we were a part of it. And I think that's part of the, 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 the lifelong, uh, you know, part of my soul, which is I have to give back and, and help my community move forward in, in this, in this right. wonderful country called America. Now, as we have this discussion now, we're in the African American History and Culture Museum, to which you're one of the largest donors. Okay. This is very near where Martin Luther King gave a speech. Exactly right. And your mother uh, was living in Denver at the time that right. you Correct. were brought here. But she grew up in Washington, she as did. you point out. And mm -hmm. your grandparents, what did they do? My grandfather actually was the postmaster general for three post offices here. Uh, in the D.C. area. And before that, when he was in high school, he actually worked in the Senate building. And what he did was he actually worked in the Senate lounge and he served coffee and tea and, and you know, could, took you know, hats and coats from various senators as they came in. When President Obama was first inaugurated, I brought my grandfather, who was 93 at the time. And while we were sitting there and in our seats and you know, really, really understanding 
and feeling the majesty of the moment for him. He said, see, Grandson, you look up there in that Senate building, and he pointed to a window above one of the flags. He said, I used to work in that, in that, in that room. And he said, I remember looking out that window when FDR was being inaugurated. And he said, I remember there wasn't a black face in the crowd. And here we are, and I'm sitting with my grandfather, seeing the first black uh, president being inaugurated. He said, America's a great place, so long as you're willing to work hard and, and, and drive forward on a set of principles and ideals that, that, that are important and, and, frankly, authentic. So that sticks with me to this day. So you went to Cornell, and you majored in engineering? I did, chemical Chem engineering. And now the school of chemical engineering is now named after you as a result of gifts that you've given. How about that? <laughs> you graduate from Cornell, mm -hmm. and then your first job is at Goodyear? Yeah, Goodyear Tie and Rubber. Right. And you went to Air Products and Chemicals? Right, went to Air Products and Chemicals and worked in applied research and development and had some wonderful experiences there. I developed some, so a line of products, believe it or not, called Freshback that actually extended the, the shelf life of foods. And then from there, went into Kraft General Foods and there I had product equipment and process development. Um, and for me, my whole life and at that point, I was all about, you know, how do you create a solution, a unique solution that no one else had come up with, create ideas that no one else or, you know, that had, had ever come up with and solve problems. How did you go from working in the engineering uh, partners <laughs> of these various companies to a financial engineering sure. world of Goldman Sachs? Sure, it's actually a quite an interesting story. I, I had done very well, was you know, top student for our first year in business school. So I had to come back for the summer graduation to get this award. And uh, as they went through my background, there was a gentleman by the name of John Utendahl who ran his own uh, investment bank at the time who was a keynote speaker. And he comes over to me after the, they give me my award. He gives a speech. He says, hey, you have a really interesting background. Uh, have you ever thought about a career in investment banking? And I said, well, I said, there's a bunch of former investment bankers in my class. I don't like any of them. And he right. says, well, why not? I said, well, they think they know everything and they're pretty arrogant. I said, you got to understand, I'm an engineer. We do know everything. It bothers right. us. And he chuckled. And I was happy that, that he, he didn't take offense to, to my joke. But what I did was I said, you know, honestly, I don't understand what investment bankers do. You know, I was a scientist. I was a technologist. I, you know, I, I thought about the world through that lens. And this is another case where someone extended themselves for me, which is why it's important that I continue to pay that forward. And he says, why don't you come to my office and let's talk about it. So he invites me down and we sit down and we have lunch. He picks up the phone and David calls people like Stan O'Neill. Okay, at the time was a CFO of Merrill Lynch, ultimately ran Merrill Lynch and Ken Chenault. And These as are all prominent African-American business all leaders. All prominent African-American African business leaders. And all of them took the meetings. And from there, they introduced me to other people to take meetings. I literally had over 100 interviews in the fall of my second year in business school and figured out that mergers and acquisitions was the only business I wanted to be in uh, in investment banking. And I said, because with the exception of warfare, it's how assets get right. transferred on this planet. It's a CEO mm -hmm. level discussion. It's a board level discussion. It's a strategic discussion. And that was quite interesting to me. And I thought I could add particular value and insights into, into that particular business. Okay. The three jobs you had before mm -hmm. you went to business school, did you feel any discrimination against you because you were oh, African-American? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, I, 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 it's one of those in America I have and still do. You know, I remember a time when I was actually at Air Products, and I was invited to give a talk uh, in California, in, in San Francisco, at one of the big conventions. And this, this you know, uh, man comes over and he, he asks questions about, well, how does it work in the extension of shelf life of rice and cooked rice? And I'm telling him how, what the, you know, explain the, the, the dynamics, the biology and the organoleptic uh, uh, issues you have to think about in addition to the microbiological issues. The guy said, you know, you, you, you're a very smart guy. You just have your heritage to overcome in order to be successful in business. And, you know, that kind of stuck with me at a time right. that, you know, after all of this wonderful work that I'm doing, he still viewed me through that right. lens as opposed to the work that I had done. So you went to Goldman and said, I'm leaving. Right. Did they try to talk you out of it? I of presume course. they did. Of course. At some point in time in your life, you know, you've got to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, you, you have to take a little risk. Business School, and I assume you did pretty well there because you went to Goldman Sachs afterwards. Right. But what year did you join Goldman? In 1994. So you worked there for a while, mm -hmm. and then how did you decide to you wanted to go into technology banking? Right. So like all things, you know, land of the blind, one-eyed man is king. And at the time, technology for us was it was defense contractors. We had a, mm -hmm. another company we took public, one called Microsoft. We had this other company we called on called IBM, and that was the world of technology as far as Goldman was was concerned. Were there a lot of African-Americans in the technology area at that time? 
Very few, <laughs> very few. Ours was our first m and banker on the ground in San Francisco focused on tech, and then we decided to form a tech group. And so that created the whole, another whole other nexus and dynamic of, of, of opportunity. Your job is to convince clients to hire Goldman. You got and it. And to give them good advice. Right. Did you meet Steve Jobs? I, I didn't meet Steve Jobs personally, but I was on the team that we actually got engaged. We had to, at the time, you may not remember this, uh, Apple was under assault. Oh. Steve said, I'm not coming back unless there's a different board. So we fired the board, got rid of the CEO, and invited Steve to come back. All right, so you're yeah. doing very well out there. You're now mm -hmm. living in San Francisco area. You're making a big success you're by investment banking standards. I presume you're you know, highly compensated and so mm -hmm. forth. What propelled you to say, I'm going to give all this up and <laughs> go start my own company? Right, so the interesting thing that occurred, as you know, again, as an engineer, the th I realized way back in my Goodyear and Tire and Rubber days, the impact that software really had on businesses. The thing that I noticed that there's very few software companies were actually efficiently run. Well, why? Um, the big part was most executives who started software companies, well, they wrote code or they knew a market opportunity and they sold the code. There was never anyone who taught them how to run software companies. So I then run into this, this small company, I'll say small, in, in Houston, Texas, that is the most efficient software company I've ever seen. They had some very basic things that they just did extremely well. And I said, wow, if you took those basic things and, and actually applied them ultimately to other enterprise software companies, you could run those businesses very similar to the way they ran theirs and would create tremendous value in those companies. That, that was the idea, that was the conceit. And they said, that's a good idea, why don't you do it? Well, yeah, in essence. They said, well, if you actually thought about taking some of these best practices and putting them, buying enterprise software companies and driving them forward, you could actually do pretty well. And I said, that's a great idea, would you do that? And I said, well, you know, and they gave me one of those offers that looked quite interesting. And I remember my lawyer said, this is a bad deal, Robert, but you should take it. <laughs> right, so you went to Goldman and said, I'm leaving. And right. Did they try to talk you out of it? I of course, they did. of course, they made the pitch against it. But, you know, I, like all things, David, you, at some point in time in your life, you know, you got to look yourself in the mirror and said, you know, you, you have to take a little risk and go see if this is something How that's How old were you work. when you took this? I was 39 years old, okay. and it's, oh, it's so interesting. So, of course, I started doing research. It was the same age that others right. left what they were doing to go start their businesses. So I said, well, let's go give it a run. All right, so you started buying companies with the money that from this Houston company. Right. How many deals have you now done? If you look at it today, it's uh, a little over 300. One of the things you did that was unique, many people think that buyout people, what they do is they lever up a company, borrow right. a lot of money, tell the CEO, do the best job you can, and then they you know, hope for the best. Right. What you actually did was something different. You actually put a system together to make sure every one of your companies was going to follow the system. Can you explain that? Sure, uh, and, and it's important. You know, early on in the world of software, you couldn't borrow money on software companies anyway. It wasn't until probably 06, 07 uh, till you could actually lever up software companies. So there was no debt available. So the only value you, the value that you could create had to be inherent in the business. You had to now improve the operation. So what we now do, we took you know, these kernels of best practices and in essence have now developed a whole systemic approach. Here's how you use this best practice to improve the, 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 the efficacy of whatever that functional area is within, a, within, a, within that company. We then have a a group now called Vista Consulting Group that delivers, I have over 100 people in that group, that actually deliver these best practices right. with the, to the management team, and the management team adopts those best practices. The way I like to think about it, we install the best practices in those businesses that actually cracks the Rubik's Cube of profitable growth. Not only are we increasing the profit margins of those businesses, but we actually can accelerate the growth in those right. businesses at the same time. Well, let's describe Vista today. How many employees does Vista have? We have about 300. So call it 100 or so in my investment team, 100 and so in VCG, and call it 100 or so in administration. So 300 okay. people in the core of right. what is Vista. At what point did you realize you were pretty good at this? Was it the first year, the second year, <laughs> the third year? Or when did you realize, hey, I'm really good at this? It, it, it took a while, believe it or not. It wasn't until we really finished our first fund. We actually closed out the last deal in the first fund and said, Phew, we actually are pretty good at this. You've signed the giving pledge. One thing we have to do is ensure that our society is a just society. Our society has the ability uh, to actually cure its own problems. And you know, while we accumulate wealth on the one hand, you know, we need to also solve the problems that, we, that are facing us today while we are alive. Well, so I guess I need to show you this. Anyway, David, here we go.
So. All right, very impressive. What we have here is this center is designed really to capture uh, all of the records of the African American experience. And you know, there's the, the records that were institutional. You know, if you think about Freedom Bureau and other places, we can now go and capture those and digitize them, and you can have access to them. This is the, you know the best of the institutional records. But the real beauty here is how do you now go and give everybody a chance to put their family's history and their narrative as part of the U.S. environment or a part of being part of the U.S. here in a place that's accessible. So generation upon generation can now find, you know, who they were, what they're, how they contributed, right. and not just the 500 people that we see represented that everyone knows, but the millions of people right. who have come. What before. about your family? Well, I, I hope that they're here, but um, I'm excited. We should probably go take a look and see if any of that is uh, accessible at this point. Ancestry and in Family Search, you can search for individual people. The first hit we get is a World War II draft That's him. card. That's 1915. What did I say? 1914. That's him. So let's close. Yep. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Holly A. Young. Yep. There you go. Born about 1881, mm -hmm. so that was a good guess. And the census. This is the 1940 That's federal your grandmother. census. Hey. Great grandmother. Great grandmother. Great grandmother. So here you can see they live on Florida Avenue. Yep. Exactly right. Wow. Mm -hmm. She's a domestic, mm -hmm. and they're renting their home. Yeah. She's got an eighth grade education, uh -huh. and in the 1940s census, she's 59 years old. Yeah, there we go. Oh. And so do you recognize these other names? Those are all my grandfather's siblings. Okay. Very so impressive. Looking, so you help put this? this together, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty well, neat. Great. When you became very wealthy, which is in the last few years or mm -hmm. so, um, you became very involved in philanthropy. Much of your giving has related to African-American related projects or causes, and uh, I'd like to just talk about a couple of them. Sure. The African American uh, History and Culture Museum, right. where we're now at, yeah. uh, what attracted you to that uh, cause? Sure. There are two elements. We, we have been stained by the history of, of slavery and, and, and still stained by the uh, part of, you know, of racism. But what we need to do is make sure we have a monument to the people who have actually you know, put their blood into the soil that created what is the best country in the world. So that's point number one. Point number two, I think it's important that the people, African American people, have a place to come to feel a sense of pride of who we are and where we're going and also contribute their story. The majority of my gift is the, actually the digitization of the African American experience. So any family can now digitize their photographs, their narrative, their, their, you know, their, their, their videography, whatever it might be, and it's now a part of this museum. And people will be able to learn right. about their family histories in, in, in ways that come alive. Mm -hmm. Was this something that your parents uh, instilled in you, or why did you decide to become such an active philanthropist uh, yeah. in just a few years? I saw my mother uh, write a $25 check to the United Negro College Fund every month growing up. And even when I wanted a new pair of you know, Converse All-Stars, uh, she said, go earn the money to get them yourselves. And so you wrote that $25 check, which I could have bought two pairs with, uh, you know, she, she instilled in me the importance of giving to the community. I saw my father, who, who was on the board and ran, you know, the, the local YMCA, it was the East Denver YMCA, and, you know, how he contributed time and energy and, and intellectual capacity on raising funds so the kids in our neighborhood could go uh, and spend, you know, camps or summer camp and, and enjoy the outdoors and understand the importance of the outdoors and building one's sense of spirit and one's soul. So all through my life, uh, growing up, uh, you know, philanthropic endeavors were part of my family, my family dynamic. You signed the giving pledge. Was yeah. that hard to do, which says you're going to give away half your wealth? Yeah. It was not hard. You know, it's, 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 it's so interesting, you know, I, it, it, and it's wonderful that, you know, the Bill and Warren and folks like you are actually out there having uh, and being evangelists for what this is. One thing we have to do is ensure that our society is a just society. Our society has the ability uh, to actually cure its own problems. And, you know, while we accumulate wealth on the one hand, you know, we need to also solve the problems that, we, that are facing us today while we are alive. 
part of what I think about is I know today the problems that are facing the communities I care about. And if I have the capacity to do something about them, frankly, it's on me to do something about them. And the Giving Pledge is a, is a good way to, to put a signal out there that say, listen, this, this is the right thing for anyone who accumulates wealth of any size, irrespective of whether you sign the pledge. Um, to actually care about the community in, in very meaningful ways. You have another very interesting philanthropic uh, project. You have a ranch that right. you have converted. Yeah, it's called Lincoln Hills. It's actually the oldest African-American resort community founded by African-Americans. And it was founded as a place where African-Americans could buy a plot of land for $25, build a cabin, and that's where they would come in summer and spend their vacations. I went up there the first time when I was uh, just uh, six months old. So it goes way back in, in history. Everyone from Duke Ellington to Zorro Neale Hurston to Langston Hughes and Count Basie all come there. They stayed there because they could not stay in the hotels in Denver during that, that, that period of history. So over time, this, you know, after desegregation, like a lot of the African-American institutions kind of fell in disrepair and got sold off in different parts. And now we've developed a wonderful program that serves our community in so many different ways. 6,000 inner city kids every summer come to the ranch. We also get to about two to 300 wounded veterans every year. In the winter though, um, when the ranch is pretty much shut down, one of the things that we identified, my, my wife identified this, was um, that there are programs, uh, one's called Together We Rise, who we partner with, that actually uh, handles aging out foster kids. So now we have built uh, at the ranch uh, a 16 bedroom ranch house and we, we can host up to 30 oh. kids during the, during the holidays. So we host them and do all sorts of fun activities with them. You're a big fly fisherman. I love it, yes. Now tell me what the appeal is because uh, you have a big brain and you're trying to outsmart a fish that has <laughs> a, a little very brain. small brain. Yeah. So why is that so complicated? <laughs> it's, it, 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 be, because those little brains are, are, are actually focused on outsmarting you because you're in their territory. But the beauty of it, honestly, David, is nature. Uh, you're standing, I think about, you know, all things in, in this world uh, that we live in today depend upon water in order to live. I think about water as being, in essence, the literal lifeblood of this planet. And you're standing in this water with your feet on the soil and the water is rushing around you. And at some point in time, if you open yourself to it, all things become one. Right. And you stand there and you start to realize that you are part of this greater this greater consciousness right. of existence. And, and this is the fly fishing is just a way to stand in the water without looking ridiculous. Now, uh, your parents are alive? Uh, my, my mother still is. She's, and uh, she must be extremely proud of what you've achieved. Does she call you all the time to tell you how great you are? She, she usually calls me to tell me what I need to do a little better. Her thoughtfulness about what our community needs uh, is still very relevant and valid. And so she identifies areas that she says, you know, Robert, you need to think about this and how can you help this one kid or these hundreds of kids in, in, in certain ways. So well, what is the greatest pleasure of your life? Pleasing your mother or making a great deal of money, giving away money? Catching a 30 inch rainbow. Okay, <laughs> all right. No, the greatest pleasure in all honesty, David, is frankly to, to, to liberate a human spirit. And when you're able to liberate a human spirit and see that spirit right. really become its best self and that person become its best self, that is the greatest thrill on the planet. So what would you like to be, uh, have people say as your legacy? Eventually you might slow down, you might do something else. Would you ever go into government? You know, I don't know. You know, I, like all things, you, you look for areas that you can bring a unique solution to and, and solve a problem. I think the, the problems I want to solve now are an equalization of opportunity for African Americans to help them on board into what is the, the commercial enterprise that is America. You know, how do we create sustainable career opportunities for people, not just a job um, or not just a you know, place to go work. And I think it's through the education, it's through internships. So I, I hope that I'm able to establish and build a sustainable fabric to identify uh, these folks uh, get them educated in, in, in you know, a series of schools, get them the right internships, and put them on a path to not only be creative business leaders, but also creative engineers and technologists that contribute to what is the fabric of America. Robert Smith, it's a great story, a great American story. Congratulations on what you've achieved, and thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you.